Hallo und herzlich willkommen zur 42. Ausgabe von Weinverstehen leicht gemacht vom 8. Mai 2021. Mein Name ist Florian Bold, ich bin Weinakademiker und freue mich sehr, dich zu dieser besonderen Ausgabe begrüßen zu dürfen. Ja, es ist keine normale Ausgabe, aber eben auch keine Sondersendung, sondern ich dachte mir, ich spule einfach diese besondere Aufnahme einfach in den normalen Turnus mit ein, weil es einfach so gut zum Thema passt und eine perfekte Ergänzung ist. Was ihr heute zu hören bekommt, ist ein Mitschnitt für eine Online-Weinverkostung ausschließlich für Weinakademiker und Gerhard Kracher war so freundlich und hat mir die Erlaubnis erteilt, von seinem Tasting einen Mitschnitt zu machen und dann als Podcast-Folge zu veröffentlichen. An dieser Stelle also mein ganz herzlicher Dank an Gerhard Kracher, der Top-Winzer, wenn es um österreichischen Süßwein geht. Kracher ist beheimatet im Burgenland in dem Örtchen Ilmitz, das auch östlich vom Neusiedler See liegt und damit in unmittelbarer Nachbarschaft von Golz und Paul Ax. Wir haben insgesamt in dieser Verkostung sechs Süßweine in aufsteigender Qualität und Süße verkostet. Diese Weine sind alle durchweg extrem lecker und man muss sie einfach auch probiert haben, wenn man sich mit österreichischen Wein beschäftigen möchte. Ein kleiner Wermutstropfen für alle, die nicht im Englischen mächtig sind. Da bitte ich um Entschuldigung, aber wegen dem internationalen Publikum ist diese Verkostung auf Englisch abgehalten worden. Da vielleicht ein paar Quick Facts zuvor, was wir in dem Rahmen der Verkostungen gelernt haben. Zunächst einmal sind die Reben zwischen 0 und 61 Jahre alt. Die Weine waren, wenn es sich um Bärenauslese und Trockenbärenauslese handelt, alle im Holzfass. Eine BSA wird in keinem der Weine durchgeführt, weil in aller Regel die Lese so spät stattfindet, dass sich keinerlei Apfelsäure mehr in den Weintrauben befindet. Und dann kam noch die Frage auf für die besten Jahrgänge der letzten Jahrzehnte. Da gab es in den letzten Jahrzehnten fast keinen, der nicht dazu zählt. Aber Gerhard meinte, die zu seinen besten Jahrgängen zählt er 2017, 2015, 2010, 2008, 2004, 2002, 98, 95, 90, 86, 81 und auch mein Geburtsjahrgang 76 und last but not least 1959. Ja, die Weine haben natürlich eh alle ein biblisches Alter vor sich. Sie reifen hervorragend und müssen auch nicht so jung getrunken werden, wie es wir in dieser Verkostung gemacht haben. Da waren die meisten Weine aus 17, was im Augenblick für die meisten Weine auch der aktuelle Jahrgang ist. Ein kleiner Hinweis, die Audioqualität ist nicht die allerbeste, ich hoffe das zu entschuldigen und der liebe arme Gerhard hat sich dann auch zusätzlich zu seiner Erkältung, die man an der einen oder anderen Stelle hört, auch noch verschluckt, sodass ich ein bisschen was rausschneiden musste von seinem Husten und Verschlucken, aber ich hoffe, ich habe es einigermaßen hinbekommen und wünsche euch nun viel Spaß beim Zuhören dieser Verkostung. We will start uh, with the wine, uh, the first wine that everybody is informed. Uh, please open uh, all the wines right now. Um, the wines need a little bit of air. I mean, they were uh, basically uh, re-bottled from big bottles into the small ones, so they had a little bit of air at that point, but uh, also for the sweet wine, especially for ours, uh, they need some air to develop. Uh, my recommended glass is a uh, white wine glass because all the wines are young. And uh, for young sweet wines, I prefer uh, like universal glasses like this, the Gabriel glass or like uh, uh, Riesling glass from Riedel, which is also nice, uh, or the Chianti glass from Riedel, all good. Uh, for riper sweet wines for, with uh, 15, 20 years plus of age, uh, I personally uh, like the Riedel uh, Sotern Sommelier glass. This is uh, the shape uh, like a, a turned around drop. And uh, uh, for especially for aged sweet wines, this is uh, a wonderful glass. 
Okay, so let's start. I'm very happy that you all joined us uh, for that tasting uh, going through the Podritis world. Here in the back of myself, you see a wonderful picture of a Podritis uh, a bunch of Podritis berries, which we can't see outside in nature right now because it's a little bit too early. That will start in mid of October. But this looks really perfect. This is how it should be. You see this uh, um, gray fungus on the berries. And this is like perfect. This is uh, how it should be. And uh, Podritis uh, is a fungus also called noble rot. Noble rot because it's uh, the most noble form of concentration uh, um, in, the, uh, in the winemaking process. It's a natural uh, uh, thing and um, it's only happening on a yearly basis. Like every year in uh, four areas in the world, uh, it's uh, Sauterne in France, it's uh, the Mosul in Germany, it's Tokai in Hungary, and here at the Lake Neusiedlersee. And um, there it's happening really on a regular basis. And uh, in all of these areas, except of ours, uh, there are sometimes vintages where you can't produce. Here, since the history started of our winery, which is uh, 60 years now, um, it's, uh, it has never happened that there was no botrytis. It has never happened that uh, we couldn't produce up to the highest quality, to the Trockebian Auslese, short form TBA. And this is very unique. And uh, I hope it will never happen that we can't produce, but until now, it looks good. Uh, here's a question, uh, what's the best temperature for the sweet wines? Um, uh, I always serve them uh, like white wines, um, especially in summer, very cold, like five, six degrees from the fridge because they are warming up. When I drink them then, then they have like 11, 12, 13 degrees at least because uh, they are warming up in the glass. And for tasting, I like around 15 degrees because uh, then uh, the wine shows its full structure. When it's too cold, uh, all the, the smells and the taste are hidden a little bit. And um, uh, so between 12 and 15 degrees, I would say is the perfect temperature. So we are starting now uh, with Spätlese Cuvée 2017. Um, I'd like to start uh, now with that. Uh, before I go on with history of our winery, because then we have something in our glasses and everybody uh, is thirsty, inclu thirsty, including me. And uh, we want to drink something uh, before we keep on a uh, serious talk. So Spätlese, translated late harvest, is uh, the entry level of the Petritis wines. There's a lot of Spätlese produced without Petritis. In our winery, always has between... Uh, 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 depending on the vintage, between 5 and 15% of botrytis. I always like, love to have some botrytis inside because the tasting profile is more intense with botrytis. And that's why I like to have in our spade I produced from our winery, uh, the style with botrytis. I love this uh, very nice uh, nose uh, of uh, wild growing flowers. We're living in the middle of a national park and uh, uh, the season of the flowering of uh, the little flowers has started now and it's exactly the smell which you have outside there at the moment. So spring is here already. Today we had uh, 20 degrees Celsius, which is very nice. I appreciate that much more than winter. A little bit of apricot in the nose. Uh, the varieties is uh, Pinot Blanc, uh, Chardonnay and about 10% of Valsch Riesling. Uh, here's a question of free sulfur and total sulfur amount in Spätlese. Uh, free sulfur at bottling is around 50, 50. Uh, total uh, sulfur amount uh, uh, 2017 uh, around 170, 180. <coughs> now we taste the wine. The wine has uh, about 60 grams of residual sugar. And when we taste now, there's again this flowery character in the front. We have some citric uh, fruit aromas. 
We have some apricot. We have some uh, some peach, white peach, fresh white peach, apple, pear. And the finish is not really sweet. I mean, 60 grams is quite a lot. But the finish, there's some saltiness, there's some spiciness, there's some herbals. And uh, I personally love this wine uh, for Asian food, for spicy food. Not too spicy, just on the starting style, uh, because it fits very well to that. Uh, I like it at the moment. It's the starting season for asparagus, marinated asparagus. Uh, Mr. Spade Laser is fantastic. And the best way is uh, in the afternoon on a terrace, just drink it as it is. It's, um, it has this nice drinking flow. It makes your mouth want a glass more. It's a uh, wine for fun, very enjoyable. Uh, here is a question. Uh, um, the special soils around the lake have an impact on Botrytis development beside the climate. Um, well, it's uh, for Botrytis, it's a mixture of everything. It needs to have the perfect climate plus uh, the soils uh, need to be right for the wines to grow um, in a perfect way because uh, and botrytis is very weather uh, uh, sensitive. That means if we don't have the right uh, weather, it doesn't work that good. The soil is more uh, uh, more to the plants that they can develop perfect and without having the grapes developed perfectly until Podritis arrive, it doesn't work. I mean, it works, there will be Podritis, but if it's too early, you have green rot and that's uh, tasting ugly. And uh, you have to know that the Podritis, like I showed you here on the back picture, which is perfect Podritis. The real Podritis does not have uh, its own real taste like, writ like written in many school books. There is written like bready, uh, fungus taste, moldy taste, no. The perfect botrytis, what it, what it does is concentrating the components which are in the grapes anyways, plus what it gives as an extra, if I have to mention something. It's this uh, kind of, um, how do you say, uh, this candy changer finish in the end, and it brings out the saltiness a little bit more. And uh, that means it makes more harmony. Um, this moldy taste, fungus taste, uh, which is written in many books, this is the wrong botrytis. Botrytis is very sensitive, as I said, and we have from, for each vineyard from two to five different selections for each vineyard, for each plot, because botrytis does not come to every uh, Great variety, not to every vineyard, not to every berry at the same time. So we make a selection. We harvest the Botrytis grapes, leave the healthy ones outside and wait until the next Botrytis comes. We could also wait until everything's Botrytis and then harvest all at once. But as said, Botrytis is sensitive. On a certain time, it dies when it's there. If there is too much weather influences like rain or cold or wind or whatever. And then it gets from that nice shiny gray into dark gray and black. And then it's that. And then the taste is very broad and not very pleasant. And these are the sweet wines, which are just sweet and nothing else. And this is not uh, the target of us. We want to have uh, uh, sweet wines, which are uh, shiny which present the fruit, where uh, when we do single variety varieties, when you see that, uh, which you will see afterwards, they are clear on their grape variety. And um, this freshness, we want to have that. And the most important for a great wine is uh, having a certain harmony. It doesn't matter uh, if white, red or sweet, harmony has to be there. And it doesn't matter on analytics, a wine can have 16 alcohol, for example, a red wine, and it tastes fantastic, and you don't feel it. Uh, a wine can have uh, five alcohol, and it tastes fantastic. A wine can have 600 grams of sugar, sugar, and it's not clay. Uh, and that's the point what I wanted to say with that. And you will see in all the portfolio we have today, we go up to 240 grams of sugar, sugar, and you will see all these wines are vibrant. All these wines are fresh. And that's the important point. Here is um, um, another comment. Uh, 
the fresh acid uh, comes from the Welsh Riesling. Yes, part of it. <coughs> the acidity is not very high. We are here on about uh, 6.2 or 6.3. But uh, the salty herbal components in the back, uh, that makes your mouth feel acidic. And um, we are a very warm area. I don't want to hide that. So we get full ripeness and um, that's nice. But uh, uh, we have uh, our soils. And uh, we live in the middle of a national park and we have all this water. We have the Lake Noisy, big lake, uh, very shallow, which brings us a lot of humidity. And we have a lot of small lakes around our village, between our vineyards, very shallow. And uh, all this water has a uh, very, very high content of salt and minerals. And as the lake was until a couple of thousand years ago, 10 times bigger than now, it moved back very slowly. And we are the lowest part around the lake. All these uh, salty mineralic components are in our soil. And uh, the plant takes everything from the soil and gives it to the berry. And when I have done my job somehow right, it's also showing you the way. And um, uh, that's our big advantage where we live. And that's uh, also a part why Ilmitz is the heart of Botrytis wine production in Austria. Ilmitz, my hometown for them who don't know, um, it's on the east end of Lake Neusiedlersee. And uh, we have two co components, mostly influencing by weather, uh, by microclimate, which is one part the big lake, and the other part, all the small lakes, around 20, around our village and in between our vineyards. Then we have the third component for the taste of our wine, which is our soils. Um, half of our crews are standing on gravelly soil with dark soil, a mixture. And the other half is mostly sandy soil, which is really next to the lake. And uh, all this soil is full of this saltiness and of minerals. And that makes that vibrant finish. And that makes our wines, even when they are full ripe, when they are... Uh, high in sugar, sugar, sometimes even high in alcohol, these component makes the wines very vibrant. Another question, do older wines produce better sweet wines? Um, yes. I mean, uh, our range of vineyards age is from uh, zero up to 61 years. The oldest uh, vineyards are 61 years. And uh, sure, the older the vineyards, the less quantity they produce. And uh, the deeper the roots go, and the more intense uh, the berries taste. That's definitely true. Um, and um, what we see, I mean, I'm working in the winery since uh, 2001, and what I've seen that the older the age of the vines, the higher the quality. Uh, doesn't mean the higher the sugar level, which comes out at the end. It's just the profile. The profile is deeper in the older uh, vineyards. So um, the last one we will taste today, uh, which is a wine from our collection series, which is the highest quality we produce. And for this collection series, 100% uh, of the wines uh, uh, selected for that, the past 20 years came out of vineyards which were, uh, which were 35 years or older. So definitely, it makes sense. So now let's go to the next one. Uh, if there is no question anymore about the Spätlese, if there is, you can also ask later. There's it's no problem. I hope you hope you enjoyed it. Uh, it made our mouse now um, ready for the highest sweet one. So uh, next wine is uh, Tamina Auslese. Auslese translated selection. Um, that's a little bit more of what dry is than in the Spätlese. So we are here on, depending on the vintage, between uh, 20 and 40 percent. Um, we are here on uh, 95 grams of Verschiedler sugar. Uh, Tramina is a very nice variety, which I love personally very much. Uh, this wine especially, uh, I love to serve um, as a starter for bigger menus, which I do sometimes at home, not right now because of Corona but uh, in usual times. And uh, there I love to serve uh, foie gras uh, as a pâté or even chicken liver pâté um, or grilled foie gras. And um, it's, it's a fantastic match. When you smell in this uh, roses flavors, beautiful. In your mouth, again, 
roses, a lot of herbals. Uh, Nelken, I don't know what Nelken means in English. Uh, if somebody knows it, please write it into the chat. Oh, cloves, cloves. Thank you. Oh, there's the question, is it Gewürztraminer? No, it's not. Um, uh, the Tramina uh, existing mostly in our area is uh, called red Tramina and um, uh, a little bit of yellow Tramina, which are all in the family of Tramina. So they are a little bit of similar by taste to the Gewürztramina. Uh, the red Tramina, which we use has a little bit more tannins, which I really like on Tramina because in this wine, when you taste it, the finish, there is not only the saltiness fighting with the sweetness, there's also the tannins, which makes it even more attractive. This herbal finish, it's a really long, it's a never ending finish. And then the fruit component comes again. There's a little bit of white pear at the end. And uh, we use red chamina as said, and red chamina has a little bit um, like reddish skins, not really like rosé skins. A little bit like uh, Pinot Gris or, or actually uh, Chasla. The Chasla with the red skins, that's actually looking by color like the red Tramina. Uh, here's another question. If it has more acidity than the Gewürz, no, all or, or actually most of the Tramina varieties uh, are very low in acidity. So is the red Tramina. You're here on about uh, 5.5 or 5.6 acidity. So quite low. And here in this wine especially, you can see how much this salty and mineralic component helps to keep that wine fresh. You know, in, uh, in Corona times, uh, uh, I also um, developed some, uh, some new uh, things to uh, taste with sweet wine or, or to eat with sweet wine. Um, it's, uh, you know, everybody in Corona watched more TV than usual, also me. So, yeah, I watched a lot of TV and I drank always sweet wine with my TV shows or movies and uh, I needed something to eat with it. Salted popcorn. The saltiness of the popcorn with the sweet wine, it's fantastic. It's a perfect match. You're sitting there, sitting your sweet wine, eating some salted popcorn. So it's a very easy thing, but uh, very pleasuring. I, I liked it really a lot. Uh, how much... RS is in the Tramina. Uh, 95 grams uh, residual sugar. Got a hint of spiciness. Yes, very typical uh, for the Tramina, the spiciness, the herbals in the finish. Um, makes it pleasant, makes it even easier um, for food pairings. Uh, I wouldn't even pair uh, sweet things with it. Uh, I would prefer like, um, uh, like pies, uh, vegetable pies. Uh, uh, I would eat some duck with it, uh, again, marinated asparagus, marinated vegetables. I think that's uh, nice matches with that. E even fish, if it's uh, seasoned in the right way, if it's seasoned a little bit more on the Asian side, this wine works very well with it. So now we are coming to the next level. We are coming to Bärenauslese. Bärenauslese translated berry selection. We are drinking now a red version out of Zweigelt. And uh, Zweigelt is the most common red variety here in Northern Burgenland. It's a crossing of uh, Blaufränkisch and Saint Laurent. So also two uh, local varieties. Uh, it was founded in the 1920s, if I'm right, by Dr. Zweigelt. And uh, this variety works very well on our soils and with our climate. And, uh, even with botrytis. And I personally like botrytis red wines a lot because uh, I like dark chocolate and uh, red sweet wines work perfect with it. I also like uh, to have grilled foie gras and when you make afterwards a sauce of, uh, of red berries with it, that's beautiful. And when you smell in this wine, very nice uh, nose of uh, very ripe plums or dried plums. Cherries, sour cherries in your mouth. Again, cherries, now fresh plums. A little bit of fig. Then you have this uh, in the finish, before the finish, you have like uh, this tiny little uh, wild growing strawberry flavors. Very beautiful. And then in the finish, you have uh, the tannins, then the saltiness, a little bit of herbals. Very intense. 
a lot of red wine character, but still a lot of freshness. We are here on 100, 140 grams of sugar, so quite high for a, a, for a BA. Uh, there is a question. I have some moldiness and some light corkiness. Normal? No, not normal. Sorry. Uh, the problem is on sweet wines, we, we taste it before uh, rebottling every bottle. But sometimes the sugar in the beginning, when you just open it, um, the cork is hiding a lot and coming out then with air. So I'm very, very sorry about that. But uh, yeah, corks are also happening with sweet wines. So sorry for that. I want to say a little bit of uh, uh, info to our winery. Uh, as said before, um, we are 60 years old now, or 61 years. Uh, I'm the third generation uh, here in the winery. It was founded by my grandfather um, since 1959. We are a real winery. It was existing before as a small mixed farming place with uh, a few rootstocks of wine. And uh, my grandfather always had the dream of uh, being a winemaker, but uh, couldn't afford to do so. And uh, uh, so it took him uh, 15 years, from 1945 to 1959, to transform that small mixed farming place into a winery. And already in the beginning, uh, he focused on sweet wines because he saw the potential of the area. Um, he saw that uh, uh, with the special microclimate, immediately he could make fantastic wines if he's focusing on sweet wines. Uh, in our winery, there was always uh, also a small part uh, for dry wine production since the beginning. Uh, so it's uh, depending on the vintage between uh, uh, 65 and 75 uh, percent is used for sweet wines, and uh, just 25, 15 to 25 percent uh, to dry wines, uh, because um, uh, we get a fantastic ripeness here. Uh, and botrytis is coming, uh, ideally, um, at the point when the grapes are ripe to overripe. So at the point or a little bit after the harvest for dry wines. So it looks uh, looks also nice for the dry wines. But our focus was always the sweet wines because uh, we live in such a special area. And um, uh, I think we, uh, we always used uh, disadvantage uh, what we have because uh, it makes us very unique. Uh, the acidity in the wine is uh, about six. It's a little bit of licorice in the finish. Yes, that's true. It's uh, it's coming a little bit like liquor. Uh, that's uh, also a thing I like very much. It reminds a little bit uh, on this uh, porty characteristics. How about the markets for sweet wines? Uh, we are working in uh, 60 markets now. Uh, so we're distributed uh, around the world. Sweet wine is the niche of the niche of the niche uh, in the markets. Uh, um, on one hand, the concurrence is much less than producing a red wine because uh, with a red wine or with a white wine, you're conquering with uh, all over the world. Uh, with sweet wine on the world market, we, you have maybe uh, five, six, maybe ten, uh, which are conquering with you. And um, so until now, uh, it works uh, quite well for us, which I'm very happy and thankful about. Uh, but I know that the sweet wine market is uh, very, very tiny. And uh, uh, if you want to be part of it, you ha always have to see that uh, uh, you are in the top range and that you are the one uh, selected for the wine lists. Because uh, as we all know, wine lists are shrinking. And I fear uh, after Corona, uh, that will be even more. And uh, like uh, 15, 20 years ago, uh, restaurants had... Three, four sweet wines by the glass. Now they have one or two, maximum, maximum two. And if only one sometimes, uh, if even. And uh, it's always the saying uh, that you are the one uh, being that on the list. Uh, or also sweet wines by the bottle. It's often very seldom in restaurants, uh, uh, especially not in casual restaurants, in high-end restaurants. Yes, in casual restaurants, they have one or two different. And it's uh, always the thing that you are the one that is offered. And, uh, that's, that's the point. Uh, there's another saying, unusual taste for sweet wine in the best sense. I found some uh, meaty, bloody aromas, finish some dust. Thank you very much. <laughs> oh, eating salty peanuts with it. Fantastic match. <laughs> I can imagine that very good. I will do that on the weekend. Never did that, actually. 
So now uh, we move on to the white version. Um, I just stopped with uh, my grandfather's history. So uh, my grandfather started the winery and uh, ran it until uh, 1981. And then my father took over. And uh, my father um, had a different vision for the winery. From the beginning on, he said, there will be the day when, uh, when uh, Kracha wine uh, can't be missed on an international great wine list. And when he said that in the 80s, nobody knew us and uh, everybody was laughing at him and said, this guy is completely insane. No one's interested in Austrian wine and uh, nobody knows Krakas and no one cares. Um, we're still working on it, uh, but we're getting nearer. So uh, we are in 60 countries, but uh, I think it will take uh, two more generations uh, to fulfill uh, my father's wish uh, completely. Um, but he made uh, the winery world famous because... Uh, he started to point out that uh, Austria can produce high quality wines, especially high quality sweet wines. And uh, uh, he traveled uh, the world and uh, showed to people that uh, it's possible to make fantastic wines here. And I'm uh, uh, very thankful uh, for that because, uh, I mean, uh, my father died in 2007. And since that, um, I'm running the winery. And uh, so I could build uh, uh, on a profound structure. Uh, when I started, uh, which helped for sure a lot. What uh, used, uh, used to be the bottle sizes uh, back then? Um, um, in my grandfather's time, it was uh, mostly also 375, about half actually, half 375, and uh, the rest was uh, uh, 0.75, so the full bottle was more common. Nowadays, it's uh, for sweet wines, it's mostly uh, uh, 375. Sometimes they used also 0 0.5 uh, liters because uh, there was always a lack of bottles, so they used what they could get. So now we are coming to the Berenhaus Lese Cuvée 2017. Uh, this is our most important, most famous wine. Uh, this is the wine sold in a lot of restaurants around the world by the glass because it's a fantastic uh, dessert all rounder. Uh, it, it, it has the structure and the body and the sweetness to work with extreme desserts like uh, creme brulee, New York cheesecake, uh, or on the other side, like uh, epoise, which is very extreme. <coughs> Sorry, but it has the freshness, the fruitiness, and the acidity to work also with lighter desserts. So um, it fits to like 95% of desserts you can imagine. Um, it's uh, a blend of our main varieties, Welsh Riesling and Chardonnay. Chardonnay for the power and for the citric aromas, Welsh Riesling for this uh, quince aromas, apple, pear, um, honey melon. And these two varieties together make for us a perfect harmony. Uh, this wine has now 135 grams of Russian sugar. And 17 was a fantastic vintage, and uh, uh, it's one of the best rated uh, BAs we ever had. It uh, just got recently from uh, Decanter uh, uh, the Platinum Award uh, and 97 points, had 95 points at Parker, and so on and so on. So, um, I mean, it's very often said that uh, uh, ratings are not that uh, interesting and not that... Um, important anymore. Uh, I always say when I get a, night, a nice rating, it always puts a smile on my face because uh, uh, everybody likes it when his work is admired by somebody. And uh, if somebody says, uh, this is fantastic. So um, I personally only can say, I love these ratings uh, because when they're good, I ha I'm happy. Uh, on the other hand, if I get a bad rating, I'm very sad and um, uh, um, yeah, when you meet me then, you shouldn't talk to me for the next five days. So, <laughs> so it's also a bad thing on it. But uh, until now, our ratings were always good. So, so I feel happy. Um, there's a question, how much bottles are produced on the Bernhaus laser? Uh, that depends extremely on the vintage. So we work with nature and uh, we work with a lot of influences of nature. So it's like, like this. So uh, 2017 uh, was one of the, of the, of the greatest vintages uh, for sweet wine, and especially for the category of the Anos Lazy we ever had. 
And um, uh, we are already on 2018 now, so I can't remember the exact number, but it must must have been around uh, 80 to 90,000 house bottles uh, uh, of that wine. Um, but for example, the vintage, previous vintage, 2016, was very small. And uh, uh, because of the frost, so we lost a lot uh, due, uh, due to spring frost, and they reproduced only 25,000. So uh, there's a big variation uh, within the vintages. Oh, here, here you have this beautiful smell of uh, fresh cut it, very ripe quince. I love this smell. That's very typical for the Welsh Riesling. Combined with a little bit of citric aromas, that's from the Chardonnay. When you taste it, you have again uh, quince, honey melon, very ripe pear, and then the finish, you have this pure saltiness, little, little bit of ginger spice, uh, very long, a little bit of herbal spices. Um, I think this wine has uh, fantastic harmony right now and uh, can age for another 20, 30, 40 years. Uh, here is uh, another question. Did you lose anything due to frost uh, this year so far? No, we were re really, really lucky so far. Um, when it was freezing uh, uh, in most of other parts in Europe, uh, here it didn't. So we were really lucky. But, you know, it still can happen. Uh, uh, we have to worry until like uh, second week of May. At the moment, the forecast says that everything's good. But uh, as we all know, that can change uh, very, very fast. Uh, there is another question. Can you name the best vintages in the past? Uh, yeah. So the best vintages in the past was uh, starting with the uh, regular vintage right now, which is 2017, which was really fantastic. Uh, 2015. Then uh, I'm, I'm just talking about quality, never quantity uh, by best vintages. Uh, 2010, uh, before that, there was a row of fantastic vintages. Uh, 2008, seven, six, five, four. This was uh, fantastic. So it was five vintages in follow, which were near to perfection. This was really, really great. And uh, before that, 2002 was fantastic. Uh, 98, 95, 94, uh, 90, uh, before that, 86, 81, which was my first vintage, which uh, was really fantastic. I'm very happy because uh, everything else in 81 is not really that good except uh, sweet wine, uh, port, and champagne. That was it. Everything else is not so... <coughs> and before that, uh, 76, 69, uh, 59. So next question is 2007, the actual vintage. Yes, it is. Uh, 2018 will, uh, for the BA, uh, will follow soon, I think in June or July. And uh, for the TBAs, it will uh, be in September. Now, there's a comment, the ginger is really amazing. I, I loved it a lot. It balances that wine so much and makes it so interesting and makes it I mean you have to think it's 135 grams of sugar and the finish is still not sweet it's beautiful it's um, uh, uh, I like that uh, um, uh, spicy salty uh, acidity uh, fighting with each other uh, and and the sweetness for sure fighting with each other in the mouth and uh, I think that makes these wines uh, so special and uh, it's um, it's something which makes it unique. So next wine, now we go to Trockenbeeren Auslese. We have now the Noble Reserve, non-vintage. Uh, this we produce since about uh, 15 years. The idea behind was uh, like a non-vintage champagne. Having a wine which is always on the same level. And uh, that's working best by blending different vintages and releasing it when we think uh, it's at the best point to drink right now, but can also age another 20, 30 years. <coughs> Sorry. And um, uh, I just have to look at the number on the back uh, to see what it is, yeah. So the main part uh, on this uh, wine, which we have now is uh, 2017, which is about 70%. <coughs> 
And then there is um, about 10% of 2018 to give more freshness. Uh, then there is about uh, 10% of 2015 uh, for the aging. And uh, then there is a few barrels, a few percentages, um, uh, which is back uh, to 10 years age. <coughs> Sorry, in barrel. And uh, I think that keeps the wine that harmonic taste. So now let's taste. I mean, the varieties are Chardonnay and Dallas Riesling, plus 5% of Tramina. The Tramina to give a little bit more of this uh, exotic flavors. Chardonnay, Dallas Riesling, and 5% Tramina. So here we are on 190 grams of sugar. Quite high. And again, with the saltiness, spiciness, the floral flavors. There's also some flavors of cinnamon and some uh, uh, Christmas bakery. Our uh, city level is here a little bit higher. We're here on 8.5. Uh, how about oak? Uh, all the wine was in oak, 100%. Uh, it's about 70% new oak, 30% uh, two to three times used. This uh, beautiful, uh, slightly smoky, little bit of uh, coconut flavor in the nose, which I like a lot. And yes, all French oak. So I hope you like it so far because uh, now we are coming to the highest level, to our collection wines. And today we have uh, the 2017 Grand Cuvée. <coughs> Blend of Chardonnay and Valsh Riesling. Uh, number six, the number because uh, our collection wines, <coughs> sorry, uh, we have all these different varieties. And sometimes from one variety, two or even three versions because the characteristics are so different. And uh, the higher the number, the higher the concentration. Each vintage numbered new, starting from one up to whatever how many we could do. In uh, 2017, it was 10 different wines. In, uh, for example, 2016, only three. In 95, it was 15 different wines. So it's always depending on the wine. The higher the number, the higher the concentration. Does not mean the better the wine. And um, this wine has to be uh, the Valsh Riesling part in uh, Southern Schlitter cask, Slavonian oak, and the Chardonnay part in new uh, French oak for about two years. Uh, there's a question. Uh, um, if the combination of Chardonnay and Dalsh Riesling was known before, if it's an invention by us, uh, it was an invention by us, actually. We do that since, <coughs> sorry, uh, since end of the 80s. So, yeah, it's more than 30 years. Here we are on a 240 grams of sugar. So now I took a sip and my coughing is better. Fantastic. <laughs> we'll try this house. And uh, uh, here we have this, uh, this beautiful harmony again. 240 grams of sugar. When you smell it, you have a little bit of this uh, butterscotch, uh, milk caramel flavor, uh, sweet coconut, a little bit of smokiness. When you taste it, you have again from this Valsh Riesling, very clear and very pure, this uh, uh, quince, but now in a cooked version. A little bit of uh, pineapple from the Chardonnay. And you have again this uh, very ripe or cooked apple. <coughs> That's more from the Valsh Riesling. And then the spice in the finish, it's beautiful. And then there comes again, in the aftertaste, there comes again the pineapple and apricot, fresh apricot. And there's a comment, sweet wine used to be medicine. Yes, it's true. Um, in uh, more than 100 years ago, when the first operation were made or when people were really ill, uh, they gave them sweet wine because everything's full concentrated. All minerals, all vitamins. Uh, plus with the sugar, it helped to recover the body. Uh, it helped to gain a little bit of weight for the people. 
And the botrytis uh, is uh, related to the penicillin. And uh, <coughs> when you have a flu, like I have right now, uh, I drink every day before I go to bed a nice glass of uh, high concentrated TBA and it really works. It just got worse right now because before, like 10 minutes ago, when I took a sip, it ran through the wrong line. I ran for a little bit of flu already. Uh, that's not that good. <laughs> but now it's good again. Uh, can you comment on MLF on sweet wines? What is MLF? Oh, ha, BSA. Yeah, sure. More lucky from the patient, sure. Uh, well, um, there is no malolactic uh, on sweet wines because the harvest is so late that there is no uh, apple acidity or just tiny bit of apple acidity left, which could be turned into milk acidity. So basically, it can't happen because it's not there. It's, uh, uh, I mean, it could maybe on a Spätlese, but I actually never checked if there is apple acidity in a Spätlese, but uh, I know definitely that in the BA and TBAs, uh, because it's harvested so ripe and so late that there is no apple acidity left in the berry or very tiny, so it can't happen. So any questions left? Uh, if you have more questions, please do not hesitate to ask. Uh, I hope uh, you enjoyed uh, the tasting uh, as much as I did. Oh, there's a comment, uh, fix uh, dates and tobacco. Yes, yes, very much in this wine. And the more air it gets, the more that comes out. Uh, size of the barrels, uh, for the Grand Cuvée, the Valschlüssling part, uh, 1,000 liter. And um, uh, the Chardonnay part, 225 barriques. How about for mutation? Mutation, in which cases you stop, and in which cases it stops itself. <coughs> yeah, for Spätlese and Auslese, we have to stop. We stop with uh, cold and uh, sulfur, and then racking a couple of times. Uh, for uh, the lower BAs, uh, we have to stop too with cold and, uh, um, uh, and sulfur. For higher BAs and the TBAs, uh, it stops by itself. And uh, we are happy when it even reaches a certain percentage of alcohol. Is stuck fermentation a common issue due to the high sugar level? Yes, it happens, definitely. Um, but, you know, I mean, stuck. When it stops, it stops. I don't care if a wine has 5 alcohol, 10 alcohol, or 50 alcohol. Uh, it's all about the harmony. And if the wine is harmonic with 5, I don't care if it stopped. it's stopped. Uh, I'm fine with it. And uh, We even made wines, which are not allowed to, to, to be called wines, because uh, uh, they are below 5 alcohol, which happened last time in 2015. Uh, a wine with only 3 or 3.5 alcohol, which is not allowed to be called wine. We have to name it uh, partially fermented grape mist, which sounds stupid, and uh, uh, yeah, but it's how it needs to be named, but uh, it tastes fantastic. Uh, do you use also in do you use them also in PA and Auslese? What? Uh, you mean uh, barrels? Uh, in Auslese, no. In Spätlese, no. In BA, it's uh, always depending on the vintage. There's 10 to 15 percent uh, of barrel fermented, uh, barrique barrel fermented aged uh, wines in the blend, uh, which you can't really feel by tasting. Uh, but it gives a little bit a certain better structure in the end. Can you talk about the fermentation? Yeah, the fermentation, it's uh, um, all, all natural, all spontaneous. Uh, it's not because I think it's, uh, it's better than added yeast or it's, uh, it's something special. No, it just worked for the past 3,000 years, so why shouldn't it work now? And um, in our cellars, uh, in the past 60 years, we never did something else. Um, I did some tests from 2002 to 2010, always from the same vineyard, same pressing, I uh, made two tanks, one uh, in, uh, in regular, uh, in our regular cellar with spontaneous fermentation and one in a different cellar uh, with added yeast. And uh, we bottled both wines and still when I'm tasting it, but it would serve me this uh, 16 wines blind. I couldn't tell which is natural yeast and which is added yeast. 
And in some villages, this was better, in some villages, that. Uh, so, but the problem is you don't know before you start uh, what will be better. So, yeah, it's most good. Uh, I, I just don't use it on a, on a regular basis or even we never use it in my cellar because uh, uh, there is nothing to fix which isn't broken. So if it works naturally, I'm fine with it. Yeah, and uh, there is one uh, say which I like. Remember that uh, we should drink sweet wines more often. Yeah, that's absolutely true. And uh, um, especially, you know, the finish of every fantastic meal should be a glass of sweet wine with a nice dessert. It's, uh, um, it's a big tradition and it's, uh, it's also something which is pleasuring a lot and sometimes really forget doing that. And I think we should do more often. And uh, uh, like the Italians, they call these wines uh, vini meditazione, which sounds much nicer than like we say sweet wine, which is boring. But vini meditazione, that's fantastic. And uh, sometimes I use it as a meditation wine. Um, when you had a day with uh, 15, 16, 17 hours of work and uh, everything went wrong, we all know how that is, and you come home totally pissed, um, open a bottle of that wine, drink it, and we'll see. I swear, when the bottle is finished, everything looks much different. <laughs> because, you know, your brain reacts to, uh, to nice flavors and nice tastes, and uh, this is positive. And so it also works with, uh, with your brain. So is there a special cracker style compared to other sweet wine producers in your region? Um, it is said that our style is, uh, is unique. Uh, uh, we never really said that, but, it, but it's said by a lot of uh, professionals. And uh, I always uh, love to hear that because it makes our wines unique. Uh, and I'm, I'm getting very often asked what we are doing different to others. And uh, well, to be honest, I don't have a real answer. I don't know. Um, uh, we ad do a lot of our vineyard work and cellar work uh, by feeling in this sense, uh, three generations. And uh, as it looks, um, it works really good. So it's fine. <laughs> Sulfur in wine is, um, yeah, that's a usual thing. And uh, it's less than in dried fruits. So yeah, a certain amount of sulfur. I think it doesn't really harm the body. It's, uh, yeah. It's something which is used since 3,000 years, and uh, I don't want to taste my own wine uh, being bottled without sulfur and uh, be in the bottle then for five or six years. I think it wouldn't be uh, as good uh, as I wanted them to be. Uh, there is more in sweet wines or not? Yes, and regularly as total sulfur, there is uh, a bit more in like in dry wines, but uh, I mean, to the body, I mean, when there is uh, 33 sulfur or 53 sulfur, sulfur, it doesn't matter to the body. It's, it makes no difference. The level is much below the level stated in the law. Yes, yes, we are, we are far below as stated in the law. The law level for sweet wine is 400. And uh, we are, depending on the vintage, depending on the wine, uh, between 150 and 250. Uh, very, very seldom we go up to 300, but that's happening maybe with one wine in 10 years. So uh, we are very far below. Uh, I mean, I wouldn't mind if it would be 400 in total. I wouldn't care because it makes no big difference if it's 250 or 400 uh, total so far. Um, but we give the wine as much as it needs and not more and not less. So that's the, that's the point. And, uh, uh, our wines are regularly four sweet wines, very stable anyways, um, which I also don't know why, but it is as it is. Uh, I've never analyzed that really proper, why that is that, uh, that way, but uh, yeah. What's the level of volatile acidity? Uh, depends on the concentration. Uh, in the last two wines, in the TBAs, uh, uh, on a regular basis, it's between 1.5 and 2. Uh, on the BA, it's about 1.1 to 1.5. In the Auslese, it's even below 1. On the Spätlese, it's 0 0.6, if I remember right. So I hope you all have enjoyed uh, that beautiful sweet wine tasting. I hope uh, uh, I could bring you uh, Botrytis wines a little bit nearer. And um, I would love to see you all uh, when things are open again. Uh, um, 
here in the winery. It's a beautiful place for them who haven't been here. Uh, uh, you're all invited. Be my guest. Um, if you have more questions which come to your mind afterwards, uh, do not hesitate to contact me uh, via email uh, is the easiest. Uh, just uh, write me a message and I'm happy to answer it. So uh, thanks a lot and uh, stay healthy and uh, hope to see you guys soon in real life. So, meine lieben Hörer, das war's schon wieder mit einem sehr informativen und vor allem leckeren Rundflug über österreichische Süßweine vom Neusiedler See. Ich hoffe, ihr konntet trotz der schlechten Audioqualität oder des Rausschneidens von Gerhards Hustern einiges mitnehmen. Ich kann euch die Weine, wie gesagt, nur ans Herz legen. Sehr spannend, sehr lecker, zumindest wenn es sich um bei dir um eine Süßweintante wie bei mir handelt. Ja, dann bleibt mir immer noch zum Abschluss die Aufforderung, den Wunsch, die Bitte, wie immer ihr es auch nennen möchtet, hinterlasst bitte bei iTunes und Spotify eine Bewertung für meinen Podcast. Damit profitieren wir alle von einer wachsenden Community. Das ist auch das Stichwort, nochmal meine Facebook-Gruppe anzusprechen mit gleichen na, gleich Namen. Wein verstehen leicht gemacht. Mittlerweile knapp 300 Leute, der richtige Ort für dich, um Neuigkeiten, News und Angebote rund aus der Rundum aus der Welt von Wein verstehen leicht gemacht. Ja, die nächste Episode ist dann WVLG 34 vom 29. Mai. Dort werde ich euch auch dann das versprochene Interview mit einer österreichischen Winzerin Marion Ebner Ebenauer präsentieren. Die hat auch schon sechs leckere Weine an mich geschickt, worauf ich mich sehr freue. Diese Weine zählen auch zu der ganz vorderen Spitze aus dem Weinviertel. Das soll es gewesen sein. Wenn ihr Hörerfragen habt, werdet sie los oder stellt sie auf Clubhouse. Dort habe ich mich jetzt dafür entschieden, eine geringere Frequenz zu fahren. Das soll heißen, jeden zweiten Dienstag nach der Episode, ich werde es aber dann auch nochmal auf Facebook und Instagram ankündigen, gibt es alle drei Wochen dann ein Clubhouse-Raum von mir für euch Hörer oder alle Weininteressierten. Wie gesagt, den Termin braucht ihr euch nicht merken, den erfahrt ihr nochmal angekündigt, aber jeder zweite Dienstag nach einer Podcast-Episode. So, das war's für heute. Ich wünsche euch wie immer Gesundheit, leckere Weine im Glas. Bis zum nächsten Mal. Ciao, Servus, euer Flo.